Yes, guys, welcome back to another episode of Teams Like Brighton. And as the dust settles over the disappointment over at Spurs, we now look ahead to another trip to London, over to West London this time round for Chelsea, Frank Lampard's Chelsea. Richie, uh, obviously the Brighton correspondent covering all things Albion. Uh, what are your thoughts ahead of the match? Uh, well, yeah, what's interesting is that it seems even though a lot of people will quite rightly be very uh, aggrieved and there'll be lots of grumblings about the Spurs game, it seems Brighton are very much drawing a line in the sand and looking forward to, to this game. Uh, I saw, uh, I think a couple of days ago, Brighton CEO Paul Barber went on, on TalkSport and he spoke a little bit, he was asked about obviously the... Um, the big decisions that didn't go Brighton's way. And he was very diplomatic, much more than I think most people, <laughs> if you're connected with Brighton, would have been. Um, and he essentially said, you know, referees have a tough job. We are very disappointed and angry with the mistakes and that sort of thing. But they, you know, we don't want to foster an environment where uh, young people are put off coming into the game and uh, to, to referee. And obviously, if you have a wider pool, then that means there's going to be uh, more potential talent coming in so they want the best to come there so he doesn't want everyone to be lambasting people um for days on end for mistakes it's a tough it's a tough gig as you well know tom being a referee um so he was very pretty much there was i think he was asked three or four times about that and he always bookended it with but we're very much turning our attentions to chelsea at stanford bridge and manchester united in the fa cup so turning our attentions to chelsea they are not in a good run of form. I think, uh, what was it so four games in a row, maybe, or five games in a row that they failed to score? Yeah, uh, they're down in 11th in the Premier League, only six points above Crystal Palace, who not that long ago were well, still maybe are, but probably out of it now, were you know, classed as relegation strugglers, um, or contenders, even. They, I think, it's yeah, two, uh two draws and two losses in the last four games. Obviously, they lost to Real Madrid 2-0 last night, lost to Wolves 1-0. Super Frank is in charge, but I don't... I don't rate you him love as it. <laughs> uh, I basically just want to see... I want to be present for a press conference where he goes, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah but seriously, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. um, so ah. <laughs> so I I'd like to see that on uh, Stamford Bridge on, on Saturday. But yeah, this is a great opportunity for Brighton to bounce back. Chelsea are, are, and you know, they've got, I think, a lot of talent, but it's just such a muddled, they don't know what to do with themselves. They don't know how to use, get the best out of um, those players. So uh, I don't think Frank Lampard's the, the man to do it. No no matter how much nostalgia or Champions League success you can talk about, I don't think, you know, belief isn't enough. You need some quality there, managerially. So it's not going to be, uh, I don't think Brighton have ever beaten Chelsea on their own patch and certainly in, in the Premier League maybe going back further they might have but um they've they've not had a great record against them especially I think at the bridge um but this would be a fantastic way to bounce back they need to bounce back because as we said in the previous shows um or well, the previous show Aston Villa are now sixth they've come out of nowhere Brighton are now 10 points behind the top four so you know it's probably uh a step too far for them to get Champions League, but they still want to qualify for Europe. Liverpool are very close. Brentford are very close. This is a really, really big chance for Brighton to add more, put more salt into Chelsea's gaping um, gangrenous wounds. And they need to really capitalise on this because they, they did play well at Tottenham, but they need to get a result at Chelsea. What about you? Uh, yeah, totally agree on that last bit there that uh we need to get <clears throat> we need to get a win we need to get a result um very simple uh it is interesting to see that the the array of talent that they have at Chelsea individually speaking are is one of the best in the league but they just can't seem to link up whatsoever and I I, I can't put my finger on it really uh, I I just look at what Todd Bowley was saying, which I just thought was an absolute joke when Sky Sports um, caught him in, in the streets of Madrid, uh, saying how much he had a very nice meal and that Chelsea were going to win 3-0. I, I think that's possibly the worst thing you could do um, 
<laughs> in in that circumstance. And I'm not talking about the food. Uh, I, if, if I was Frank Lampard, I'd be livid. The fact that he said, yeah, Chelsea are going to win 3-0. No, get out of this. Get Go away. You, you, you're, you're there to sign checks and you're looking at the bigger picture. I focus on the matches, not you. So the fact that he just I focus like, on losing matches and not scoring goals. I don't need you to make it any harder for me. <laughs> yeah. Got the pressure enough pressure as it is. No, but seriously. <laughs> um I, I I I think it's just so odd. And you know, Henry Winter went went in on one on the on uh Todd Bowley on Sky Sports when they were talk previewing the match last night. And Chelsea just don't seem to have that much of an uh, a give or any form of an answer. They had a couple of good opportunities, don't get me wrong, but there just isn't that kind of like that edge that Chelsea, that we have seen with Chelsea over the over the Abramovich years at least. So for me, this, this is the perfect opportunity for us to get back to winning ways and really kind of take the frustrations that we've had from Spurs and carry it on into this match and really finish the game off when we can. Um, there's not really much that we could do in that Spurs match, but I do think if we carry on the way we did play against Tottenham, we will we will be talking about three points next week. Yeah, I really hope so. I, I think, um, yeah, it's. Can, can you think of a game where in Deserby's tenure where they've had such a disappointment and bounced back well? I mean, I, I guess the first one that comes to mind for me would be obviously losing to Fulham. That was a pretty tough one. Um, obviously, that was what was it they had. 70 odd percent possession dominated the game and then mm -hmm. were hit by a cruel very very cruel sort of sucker punch um later on in the game i think the following game what they did was obviously i think they beat stoke in the fa cup 10 days later uh because the newcastle game was postponed because of the carabao cup final and then after a few days after or a week after stoke won then they thrashed west ham so maybe that's one example um uh yeah i mean it's this is what this is when you see you know the um cojones of the team can they can they bounce back from such a a disappointing result um just on a separate note if we can just take a, a step back um you touched on it a little bit tom but i mean the last six seven months at chelsea have been insane because obviously in september Everyone was shocked when Graham Potter and basically half of Brighton uh, went to Chelsea. And that was a pretty tough blow to take. And then, you know, Chelsea kept coming back for more. Uh, they got head of recruitment, Paul Win Stanley, as well in, in November. Uh, and then I believe was it uh, either at the start of this month or the end of last month, Graham Potter was sacked. Um, so, yeah, Tom, just before we dive a little bit deeper, what, what do you make of that whole weird saga and how it unfolded can i just point out the absolute irony in the fact that paul winston lee was the person to recommend potter getting the sacking as well like it, everything about it is nuts and bearing in mind as well i didn't realize this roman abramovich has never sacked more than one manager in a season and todd bode sacks two people in his first seven months um <laughs> I, 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 a, I, wow that is not i did not yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Blimey. Yeah. Yep. Hard to believe. Hard to believe. But when you look at what Bowley was trying to do, I don't understand why they couldn't keep Tuchel in his place. And when he went on that um, sports business management chat thing, didn't really give that many, in, many answers. Uh, at the moment, it just seems to be papering over the cracks at the moment i think if he wanted to go for this long-term vision then yeah keep potter in but i don't expect the results to go your way you've had a lot of injuries you haven't had any form of consistency and you've papering over by bringing in a lot of players and there, there was a great piece in the athletic where they were saying how players were sitting out of training sessions because there wasn't enough space that they have a training squad of around about 35 to 40 players, which is absolutely obscene. It's like a trials day for an under 15s kids team. You don't, you shouldn't have that many 
players in the first team squad competed for matches. If you do, then you need to kind of revise it entirely and kind of think, right, strategically, this lot need to go. This lot can just train by themselves. And then I'm going to focus on this 25 because you've got to be cutthroat in this business and you can't be so accommodating or forgiving or just be a people pleaser because look what's happened to Potter. Quite clearly, he wasn't that cutthroat about it all and he had to. He needs to have that cutthroat business that, you know, Ancelotti has or Mourinho has or Conte. Funny enough, three pre- three former Chelsea managers who have all won all won titles, all won trophies at Stamford Bridge. All of them were cutthroat, all of them resilient, all of them had an idea and where to go with this squad and it worked. Potter didn't really have that. I think he kind of he, he kind of like rode the waves in this season, looking back on it all, because he I think he was more focused on what's going to happen in the preseason. I think he was hoping to just write off this season and then just go ahead, which frankly is obscene because you can't what was it? He got, he got spent in 600 million in two transfer windows. Exactly. You, you're not going to have that. Even if you weren't responsible for one transfer window, you were still responsible for the last one. So you had to show the the results in that and you and he didn't it's uh as for top bowley i mean at one point he was a sporting director like with absolutely zero cv to it there just seems to be something there that isn't sitting right with me and i don't think chelsea fans are going to be happier in the long term i don't think there's going to be anything strategic to me i'm seeing a lot of echoes to hicks and gillett uh with bowley um, then I do, then I, then I see with sort of like a John W. Henry at the moment, there's no, I can't see success coming to Chelsea unless Bowley changes his ways, but they don't have an answer at the moment. They can't even get a long-term replacement for Potter at the moment. And they're waiting till the end of the season. So th- there's a lot there that needs to be addressed at Sanford bridge. And for me, the lot, and personally, it's a Brighton fan. Don't get me wrong. Like the longer that continues, the more, I, the more I'm going to be happy with because that just means that there's another space opening up in the big six, but we won't talk about that. And um, so it, it's going to be interesting to see what Bowley does in the future and whether or not he is truly invested in the long term. Uh, I personally don't see it. I, I'll be surprised if he lasts five years, to be honest with you. I don't think he's going to be a long, long term investor at the club at all. Yeah, I wonder if he'll, you know, he's got this new shiny toy and then he'll be after a few years, oh, I'm done playing with this. And also, like, just to add to your points there, um, they, they're they potentially coming up into view. Um, the the monster of uh, financial fair play, because obviously they've gone down the route of uh, amortization. So, you know, having these very long eight year plus long contracts uh, and some of the players that they've signed, I think Mudrick and... Um, Fernandez, uh, I think for nearly 200 million between them, they've not been great from what I've heard. Uh, yeah, so you've essentially the got, you've got these guys who um, have, you know, a whopping great deals and they could become a very, um, well, they could become a bit of an issue because, you know, you, you, you're paying for these players who are not very good and or were not doing very well and they could just be on your on your books for a long time and and um really eating into your finances uh so i, I think for what i've heard i've spoken to um uh i think it's kieran Maguire, the money expert uh football finance expert sorry um and he essentially said that one thing that you know, if chelsea don't get champions league and they won't that will really put a strain on their finances um they will probably have to sell a lot of their academy talent um, because that's a good way of balancing the book. So maybe the likes of Mason Mount, um, Loftus Cheek, Conor Gallagher, hopefully Levi Colwell to Brighton. Um, the the yeah, the, the, they're in a real pickle. And uh, yeah, I don't think a, um, a a dalliance once again with Frank Lampard is going to cure that. Um, but yes, this is, and also just final point, the, it was, a lot was made of at the time how it was like Chelsea wanted to become like Brighton. Let's just get all their players and become them. And obviously after a six or seven month period, they're showing that that's not worked out. And 
you can't, you know, it's a poor imitation. And also, I think one key factor is that uh, Tony Bloom, Tony Bloom is basically, you know, a humongous part of Brighton's success. And if you take, and the foundations are laid by him, if you take people a little bit close to the team, that might help with you. Well, that might help your cause a little bit, but, you know, Todd Bowley should have probably just tried to buy Tony Bloom or something <laughs> to have more success, but obviously that hasn't happened. But yeah, it's just the, the contrast between a very well-run club in Brighton and the absolute shambles and chaos of Chelsea. Um, you can't help have a little bit of schadenfreude for that. Um, so yes, hopefully Brighton will be able to put them to the sword um, because yeah, this is this is a real, really big opportunity. Uh, how do you... Um, would would you make any changes for the Brighton team, or would you stick with the same personnel? I think players? I think I'll stick with the same personnel. Maybe start Ferguson. I think mm. that'll probably be the only change that I'll I'll really put in there because really the whole the whole starts in eleven are in sync. Um, they're all on the same page. They're all playing phenomenally well, and I think we need to keep that momentum going especially when next weekend we've got a trip to trip to Wembley to worry about yes uh I'm just gonna bring a couple of quotes in uh from uh, Adam Webster he was he's been talking about uh the squad are still relishing the push for Europe and he said there is pressure but it's something we're all enjoying we'll all take it in our stride and we're believing I would say there's been a, a real belief around the club which um which we had towards the end of last season as well we go into every game believing we're going to win, not hoping we're going to win. There's been a shift in the mindset. Um, so, yeah, it seems hopefully they they seemingly maybe bounce back from, from that defeat. Um, we shall see. And then a quick one from De Zerbi as well. Uh, after Spurs won, he said, I'm still frustrated for the result and the way it arrived, but in football this situation can happen and we have to look forward to the next game. Uh, we are ambitious we are able to fight for a place in Europe next season, but we have to think step by step. We, we play Chelsea and want to win, and then we have to prepare in the West, best way for the semi-final. We have some difficult games, but we also have the quality to win two or three games in a row. I like that attitude from, from both of them. Would you agree? Absolutely, yeah. And like you say, like there's a, there's a shift in mentality in the players' approach. It's not about hoping for Europe it's kind of like the, the, there's almost like an expectation now they're all wanting to qualify for Europe they all want to take this club to Europe they them, themselves the players want to play in Europe that's the next stage in their careers and that's to be fair to them they they definitely have displayed a showcase to potential suitors shall we say if that doesn't come to fruition that they totally are ready for that next stage in their footballing career uh it is, I still find it bonkers. It's halfway through April and we, we are still talking about Brighton potentially being in Europe. I, I know I'm, I'm, I sound like a broken record when I say this. And, you know, Monday we, we were talking about, you know, Champions League hopes have been dashed because of... You more than me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. Me, Yeah. But yes. Me more than you. But, you know, <clears throat> we're still, we've still got a chance of Europe. We've still got a chance to book ourselves into a trip to another FA Cup final trip, our second one in our history. Uh first since I've been alive. Um that there's there's a lot there that still can get us excited about. I know that the wounds still hurt at Spurs and you know it can be amplified so much with what's at stake and that being alien to us it, again is amplified even further. But we still have the chance here to really push on for Europe. I think the players are up for it. Now it's just a case of, I think a lot of the fans just need to just water under the bridge with Spurs. We now got to address it further, especially now we've had the really good news that De Zerbi's not getting a touchline ban, which I am amazed by, by the way. So the fact that he's going to be on the touchline now for the, for the rest of the season, hopefully then, you know, we, all, all, all everything's being dealt in our favor at the moment and we just need to take we need to just take it by the horn so for those who uh haven't followed that can you just explain the latest with deserby uh because he uh, obviously i think the fa put out a statement yesterday 
yeah. So, yeah, so for those who are a bit unaware about the situation, so as you know, De Zerbi got sent off for failing to control the bench at, <clears throat> at Spurs along with Stellini after their little um, spat, shall we say. So they both were dismissed because they were the basically the they, they were the highest ranking coaching official basically so they both got showed the red cards and as a result the fa deemed it fit enough that to just find both teams um for that in reflection of what the match official at the time wrote Stuart Atwell wrote regarding why they were sent off and the incidents that happened because the charge is deemed a little bit lighter than previous moments at the Zerby's uh been sent off for shall we say so as a result of that the fa have said have warned the club reminded them of their responsibilities as a professional football club and have fined them as a result of failing to control their their bench basically uh during the match so yeah well we got a fine and well we got a slap on the wrist by the fa the Zerbi avoids a touchline ban. He could have faced one because he got he, he got another straight red card and it could have gone to as much as three matches. But fortunately, the FA were kind enough to just give us a little fine and a bit of a telling off. So hopefully um, we won't have to worry about that this season at least. And the Zerbi will be on the touchline for the rest of the season, which is great news. Touch wood, although he is a bit of a firecracker. So it's almost take it game by game on, on, that, on that one. But... Um... Sifting uh, gears a little bit, um, there's been, and sorry, it's not the best news, sorry, listeners, um, but Alexis McAllister's father, Carlos, who's also his agent, uh, has been quoted by Argentinian um, newspaper Bola Vip um, talking about his future. And obviously, McAllister signed a new contract earlier on this season. Uh, that I think runs until 2025 and there's an option to extend uh, that by another year. So it's 2026. So that puts Brighton in a strong position. Uh, but obviously after his World Cup success of Argentina, he's become much more in demand and, and you know, his name is very much uh, on the map. So Carlos, his father said, normally the next transfer window we'll find him playing for another institution. We don't know which one. We are just starting talks in general, but it is most likely that Alexis will be playing for another team next July. Uh, Tom, immediate thoughts on, on those comments? Uh, annoying, frustrating. Uh, I don't know what <clears throat> Mr McAllister is thinking really in terms of what he's going to get from this i don't know whether or not it's just contract talk although he's only just signed a new contract ahead of the world cup um <clears throat> look again I, I i did say to everyone on here i've said this on the record a couple of times on this podcast if we don't get europe we won't keep them if we get conference league it'll be a little bit tougher because I do think that there are, if it, well, if we believe the rumours back in January that Atletico Madrid and Inter Milan were looking, that's Champions League football straight away. So are you going to really stop him from going there? Well, unless they can, unless they can pay the fee that we are due, we, we've uh, no basically. But it, it is so frustrating when you have these little stories that come up because it just it doesn't help anyone out. It doesn't have the dressing room, doesn't have the player. I, I, it's just a little soundbite that is helped out on the airwaves, which which I suppose is what the Argentine media wanted. And I suppose they want their best players to go and play for better teams. But I don't think a lot of people appreciate just how good we are. I, all I'm going to say is that, you know, it doesn't matter if you're Real Madrid or if you're Chelsea. Good luck negotiating a good deal with Tony Bloom and Paul Barber because it's not going to be an easy ride, that's, that's for sure. They're, they are incredibly talented businessmen. Unfortunately, one of them is a massive, massive Brighton fan, which just adds adds to the fun that's going to happen in the summer transfer window. We'll wait and see, of course, because, you know, Kai, Caicedo put an Instagram post about how he secured a record-breaking transfer to Arsenal, which didn't happen. 
So it'll be interesting to see really what happens in the summer. I mean, all this is just hearsay at the moment, unless I hear a Comunicado official t- tweet coming from one of the respective clubs. You just, you just got to take it with a pinch of salt. Yeah, it's one of these annoying um, sort of facets of football these days. But uh, yeah, moving on, we're going to speak to Scott Trotter, who covers Chelsea for Football London, to get the lowdown on Brighton's upcoming opponents. Yes, guys, so I am joined by dear friend Scott Trotter of Football London, who covers Chelsea week in, week out. Scott, how are you doing? Yeah, not too bad. Thank you, Rich. How are you? I'm good, thanks. So Scott has just... um, He's literally got on the plane and flown straight to his house to speak to us. <laughs> he was covering um, Chelsea's loss to Real Madrid last night. Um, Scott, Chelsea's season has been nuts, to put it bluntly. Um, I guess it's the last time we, I guess as a Brighton podcast, we spoke about Chelsea was ahead of the uh, return of Graham Potter to the Amex back in October and Brighton won that game 4-1. I believe uh, Greg Potter was on a nine-match unbeaten streak until that game. Was that the sort of the beginning of the slow, tortuous end for him at Chelsea? Yeah, nothing really went right after that point, really. Um, Obviously, no doubt you remember that game and that atmosphere, I think. Certainly rattled Potter to a degree, and and Chelsea certainly weren't at it that day. And... (laughs) They've, they've really struggled to find, you know, I guess to to, to a degree, points at all from, from, from then. Um, that there have been brief moments of not necessarily improvement, but periods like March where, where they got results, um, but, but certainly not frequently enough. Um, as you said, that point with, with the unbeaten run, um, and a slightly better start to the season, though certainly not a good one under Thomas Tuchel. It, it seemed things were lined up nicely, to, you know, for Chelsea to build something. But I think really just that Brighton display that I don't know whether it was shocking, but certainly Chelsea entirely outcompeted, became a bit more of the norm. Chelsea, simply put, can't score goals and regardless of the chances they have or how well they play, they really struggle to keep in games. Um, I think I read earlier that it is something like 24 games now where Chelsea have went behind and not been able to claim a point or or some crazy stat like that. So they're not doing very well in terms of recovering from adversity. And there's been a lot of that this season. And though they had a really good defensive record, um, particularly early on in the season, uh, for a long time, it, it was certainly one of the best in the Premier League. That has been put under such pressure by the fact that they can't score goals. And, you know, as a result, you, you really struggle to pick up points. And I guess it, it, while at the start of the season, it may, it may have been a surprise, it, it's no surprise to see Brighton well clear of Chelsea in the Premier League table right, right now. So you touched upon it there as, I guess, a big um, issue for Chelsea is that they can't score, they haven't been able to score goals. Um, what would you say that, and there are some other factors as, as to why it didn't work for, for Graham Potter at, at Chelsea? Yeah, yeah. So I, I guess that, that has been the big issue for Chelsea season. I think had they been able to score goals, there would be a lot more points on the table. They would probably be a little bit higher up. And I think... If it wasn't for the fact of Chelsea slipping into the bottom half of that table, the discontent with Graham Potter may be starting to substantially move towards ownership, you know, maybe just add that bit of pressure. I think, you know, as a Chelsea hierarchy, they needed to do something to to turn the momentum round. The things haven't really improved since Potter's departure in that regard. But I, th- I think Chelsea... As a, as a club and maybe a fan base kind of struggle to buy into Potter's, you know, mannerisms um, and his press conferences, as I'm sure you're all too well aware of. He's very straightforward, doesn't, you know, buy into the, the drama or the games of press conferences with regard to transfers. He doesn't, you know, look to make a headline or 
dig anybody out or, you know, if, if there's a bad referee decision, he kind of gets on with it. And I think a lot of people felt he maybe could have bought into a few of those moments, moments to try and maybe galvanise the fans, galvanise the team, you know, kind of get that backs against the wall sort of atmosphere out to try and try and really hit back. But when that was combined with poor results, and again, maybe this is something you're, you're familiar with with Brighton is you, you would go and watch Chelsea. They wouldn't score a goal. You'd maybe have this idea that the, the XG was looking all right. They'd maybe, you know, if things were to go to XG, be look to, to be winning games, but, you, you'd be sitting there watching and you rarely felt like Chelsea deserved to come away with something um, when, when they weren't. The, there would maybe be a lot of opportunities, but they would rarely feel like there was a lot of good, real good opportunities. And that's obviously capped off by Chelsea not really having a striker to rely upon this season. Kai Havertz has been the man leading the line for them a lot, despite the the purchase of Young in the summer and David Fafana in January. Um that obviously has brought its own problems with the Bamiyang being a sign of Tuchel and then, you know, days later Tuchel getting sacked. But I think Potter, a lot of people would have liked to see him do well. It was obviously a, a chance for an English manager at a, you know, big club with big aspirations, but just not enough positivity drawn in the first six months of, of his reign to really, you know, win a crowd over. I know, before Potter's final game, I was speaking to a colleague in the press box and we were just wondering how good of a run Chelsea would have to go on for the supporters to really buy into Potter because, you know, they went unbeaten in March, I think, beat Dortmund, um, beat Leeds, beat Leicester. And then they had a slip up against Everton getting a draw. And you could already feel the crowd start to turn then. And then when... Aston Villa went ahead um, and after the international break, you start to hear a chance of you don't know what you're doing in the crowd. It, it, I think it was it just got to a point where it was too far gone for Potter to really you know, fight back against the tide of momentum that, that had emerged. So I guess there's one person we can't not talk about and that's Todd Bowley. Um obviously uh came in i think last last summer or a little bit before and i believe chelsea have spent 500 600 million on players um there's probably you could talk about this for days and you probably write about it all the time but what what's your assessment of the todd Bowley era and i guess the signings that have uh, happened during his tenure yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly been an interesting one. Um, I don't think you can look at it without the context of the situation Chelsea found themselves before he arrived with obviously the, the sanctions and everything that happened last season, putting them in a little bit of a difficult position with regards to some player contracts. And, you know, Antonio Rudiger obviously left. That was a big loss. Andres Christensen left on a free and they had a whole host of the contracts, you know, that set expired. Angola can't bear. Uh, his deals due to run out in the summer, even though he's expected to extend. Jorginho was in the same situation. And, you know, it's a really unstable time for the team, um, even for the last couple of seasons. It's it felt like that maybe the Champions League win in 2021 maybe papered over some cracks. And Thomas Tuchel, um, obviously a very good manager, might have managed to get top four, but they, it didn't feel like they were necessarily catching the teams above them, though, of course, with the, the volume of money we spent in the summer, uh, I think there probably was a great deal of expectation. Uh, Kaladuka the Bali came in, I think, not necessarily the most exciting sign, but came in with good pedigree from, from um, Napoli and filled that Rudiger role quickly. Um, I think the the big ones for fire obviously looked a good, albeit expensive sign. And, and then you can't really ignore the, the money paid for Mark Cucurea. Um His season hasn't panned out how anybody would have, would have wanted to, I don't think. But the fee paid to Brighton put that transfer in a position where even if he played well, 
it, it would be difficult to see Chelsea winning that transfer, I think, obviously with Manchester City not being willing to pay that high. And that has kind of put a lot of pressure on the player. And I think it also put a lot of pressure on Potter, even though Potter wasn't there when the same was made, just because they were so closely linked and kind of reflected each other in, in a lot of ways. Um, Aubameyang, as I kind of alluded to, was was a weird one. Chelsea kind of started the the summer not wanting to really sign a striker. I don't think there was a real big commitment from, from Tuchel to think they definitely needed one. Um, that quickly changed in the early parts of the season um, as that kind of tendency. A struggle to score goals emerged and then to see Tuchel leave so quickly after Aubameyang's arrival, the, there was certainly... Some erratic behaviour, I think, in that open and transfer market with Todd Bowley being the, the sporting director as well. There, there was a lot of business done, I think, if you looked at it from the outside of, is is this good business? Obviously, still and saying, I think there was a lot of good transfers. You, there was a lot of reason to be hopeful, but maybe ignored the need for a central midfielder, which Chelsea had kind of been crying out for in a lot of ways. Obviously, Enzo Fernandez arrived in January. That, that has been a positive sign, despite the extortion well maybe not extortionate but certainly a large fee yeah. um, he, has, he has played very well since so maybe can prove value if anybody can prove value for 100 million pounds but yeah it's just been a wild time um, I think maybe some of the criticism has been unfair to, to a degree but that said, when results on the pitch have went uh, as they have and you spent £6 million pound to try and maybe do what is three seasons worth of transfer work over the course of one, you are going to come under scrutiny and rightfully so. And when things haven't went well managerially, the ownership will rightfully come under pressure as well. Um, they, they've certainly looked to make a splash with the size of the fees, the long contracts, um, and that that is, is going to hurt them when players don't hit the ground in the likes of Mudrick in January as well. It's going to hurt them when players like Mason Mount don't want to sign super long contracts. Um, and yeah, they ha- they've certainly put themselves in, in a difficult position, I think. Now, much of that has kind of transferred to the, the sport and director group um, with... Uh, Again, unsurprisingly, another Brighton figure, um, partially at the heart in Paul and Stanley, um, Lawrence Stewart from Monaco as well, and uh, a few of the guys like Christopher Vivelle, that they are taking a more prominent role in that, that is kind of transferring, maybe distancing the ownership from a lot of things. But yeah, I think the way things have worked out, it's made the critiques that you would perhaps expect from somebody, and you know, you hear the football manager claims from Gary Neville. I don't think it has been that bad, but when the signings worked out, have worked out, the team isn't functioning, you, you can't really have too many complaints at the critiques either. You touched upon the sort of contract situation and, you know, I guess that's somewhat alluding to the, um, the icy spectre potentially of financial fair play and all that jazz. Um, from a brighter perspective, uh, Brighton fans are very curious as to what will happen with Levi Cole. Uh, I just want to get your thoughts, just a kind of prediction rather than um, anything else. How how do you think his future will go? Do you think um, because you know if Chelsea um, have to sort of you know stay within the confines of financial fair play, well they have to. Sorry, um, do you think Cole could be sold to to sort of balance the books? How do you predict that one going? Um, so with regard to financial fair play, I think, well, obviously clearly if, if Chelsea don't make Champions League, things will need to be done, but I don't think the pressure of that is quite at the stage of having to sell anybody you can, um, from that perspective, perhaps if it goes to a second year, things all of a sudden get very serious in that regard and you miss that income quite severely, I think, but Chelsea are in a position where they do need to sell anybody they can to a degree, because of the sheer volume of players they've got now. It's 31 senior players. Um, Levi Colwell, uh, I think anybody associated with Chelsea would, would kind of pray. It's, it's not him. Um, he becomes a, 
I guess, a candidate purely from the fact that Chelsea can obviously bank pure profit um, but in, in any sale with him. And I think he'd probably bring a decent fee because of how highly he regard, is regarded, how he's performed at Huddersfield and Brighton when he's not injured. And I think of, of his age group, he really, certainly at Chelsea, is regarded as, as the standout player that they've developed um, and, and that he has such a high ceiling. That would be a real shame to, to see him leave Chelsea. Um, I think the ownership were kind of really clear in the summer and that they did want him to stay for the long term. They see a place for him in the team. Whether that joins up with all these changes that have happened, a new coach to come in, there's obviously a lot of uncertainty still. Um, remains to be seen. And he was obviously present at Stamford Bridge earlier this year, I think there's a really strong indication that they do want to kind of come up with maybe a new deal for him as well. But if you then take a look from Levi Colwell's perspective in terms of he's getting game time at Brighton, he sees that they sign Benoit Badiafila, another very young left-sided central defender who has looked very good and maybe been a bit too starved of opportunity since his arrival as well, actually. But, um, Maybe it starts to become a more difficult sell. It'd be really sad if, if Colwell felt he needed to go elsewhere, but Chelsea do have a lot of central defenders. We obviously mentioned a few of them earlier on. Uh, but I think Chelsea fans certainly would rather see Koulibaly leave after just arriving um, to give Colwell that opportunity to, to maybe have a significant role next year. Um, but yeah, the Baddy Shield one looks a bit perplexing so maybe they have readied themselves for, for the prospect but every indication that, that we certainly got earlier in the season is that they do want Colwell to stay but they're, they're going to have to prove that he has a place and a pathway in, in this team and I guess where not having Champions League football or European football at all becomes more difficult is the rotation becomes more difficult as well and then when you've got two great left-sided centre-backs you know, you can't necessarily always keep them happy. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's really well put. Uh, a final one, um, so I can let you go back to sleep after your long travels. Uh, Scott, what's your prediction, um, score prediction for Chelsea versus Brighton at the weekend? Cool. Um, I would like to say it, it, it's a difficult one to predict, but to be completely honest, it, it's difficult not to look past the Brighton win once again. Um, I obviously mentioned the, the, the goal scoring issues earlier on and while Chelsea cannot score it's it difficult, really, really difficult to predict a win. Um, I think we'll maybe see some changes from Frank Lampard this weekend, maybe try some players who have maybe not had an opportunity in his first week in charge. There's lots of people like Badi Ashil, Nani Madueke, maybe Mikhailo Mudrik, uh, probably Aubameyang as well actually might get an opportunity um, so he can actually, you know, see the players he has at his disposal, see what they have to offer. And I don't think that's any disrespect to Brighton because they've had such a brilliant season, but things haven't been working for Chelsea and maybe they just need to try a few things different just to see if anybody else does have much to offer. But, you know, Brighton haven't been frightened of scoring goals and that's always going to put Chelsea under quick pressure. Um you know, may, maybe Chelsea can get a draw and maybe the way I'm speaking is quite telling about how Chelsea have played in recent weeks as well. But I think Brighton have, have been so impressive under De Zerbi and maybe built upon um, what Potter started to to an extent. And yeah, it, it is hard to look past, past them winning. Maybe that result against Tottenham last week gives Chelsea a little bit more hope that, that they can find a way through. But it's difficult to be optimistic about Chelsea at the moment, and um, certainly if Brighton score early, the the atmosphere won't necessarily be be the best. Though certainly, if um, Graham Potter was still there, uh, I think it would be a great deal more toxic, and Brighton would perhaps fancy their chances even more. Um, so yeah, it, it will be it will be a difficult game. I think Chelsea will. We'll have chances, but I think we'll see a lot of misses again. Great. Well, yeah, thanks for that summary. Uh, so just to finish up, do you want to just say where people can find your your work and, and um, your social media tags? 
Yeah, yeah. So everything will be over on Football and we'll be covering the game along with, I presume, Rich at the weekend. Um, at Stamford Bridge. Um, you can get um, a follow of me on Twitter. It's Scott underscore Trotter. Um, yeah, that, that, that's probably about it, really. We, we did a podcast today as well. It will be out. The View from the Bridge podcast where we talk a little bit about the Brighton game and some of the changes as well that Chelsea could, could make for that. Um, but yeah, looking forward to the weekend to see seeing Brighton, if not so much Chelsea all the time as well. <laughs> well, yeah, thanks so much for your time, Scott. And uh, guys, keep on liking and subscribing to Teams, like,